Vitamin D3 and risk for type 2 diabetes. There's, um, there's been an, a little bit of research about that, uh, and some came out recently. Uh, you may see it. It hit uh, some of the news uh, wires, some of the news feeds. It was an article that came out of UC San Diego. <clears throat> Vitamin D deficiency linked to greater risk of diabetes. Um, I will put the link. This is the UC San Diego um, uh, re press release, and then I'll go to the article itself. Uh, one of the co-authors, uh, or the lead author, Sue K. Park, is from Preventive Medicine at Seoul National University, but um, one of the, um, <coughs> the additional authors is Cedric Garland, Cedric and his uh, brother, I can't remember his brother's name right now, were involved in uh, breaking a lot of the original uh, vitamin D stories. They've been doing uh, work on uh, vitamin D for quite a while. Uh, I'll go into uh, this article and this concept in just a minute, but first a brief introduction. Ford Brewer, F-O-R-D, Brewer, B-R-E-W-E-R, -E -E and... Um, this is the Prevention Channel. We're uh, all about helping baby boomers um, decrease their risk for heart attack, stroke, cancer. And quite often that means if you can decrease your risk for type 2 diabetes, you've gone a long way it, by itself. Uh, or pre-diabetes, before you get diabetes, is the major cause of cardiovascular inflammation burning up those arteries which uh, supply your eyes, your brain, your heart, your kidneys and cause these major disablers and killers in our generation. Um, <clears throat> the author, the lead author was Sue K. Park. She's from the Department of Preventive Medicine at Seoul National University in uh, uh, South Korea. The um, article actually was uh, released out of the University of California, San Diego, and this is the UC San Diego uh, News Center press release. And the reason for that is the co-author is Cedric Garland, a DRPH, is a faculty member there. He and his brother, uh, let me see if I can find, um, I'll find it in just a few minutes. He and his brother were also an epidemiologist, were involved in um, putting out a lot of the original information associating um, vitamin D uh, with colon cancer risk and several other diseases. So now they're going after uh, type 2 diabetes. <laughs> this was published in the April 19, uh, 2018 uh, Journal of PLOS One. We'll talk about well, just very briefly, plus one. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> so here's what they did out of the out of the press release. Uh, they looked at uh, vitamin D levels. They looked at a level of 30 nanograms uh, as the cut point. If it was less than that, they considered people deficient. Now. <clears throat> That's 10 nanograms above what the Institute of Medicine set as the um, cut point back in 2010. And again, I think uh, the preponderance of the evidence is showing that we do need a higher level of uh, vitamin D uh, in functional medicine. A lot of uh, uh, deeper looks at prevention, we are looking at higher levels. In, in the PrevMed practice, we've gone for 40 or 50 uh, 40s or 50s um, as the level for vitamin D. Um, <clears throat> so they found that participants with lower blood levels um, or with higher blood levels above 30 had one-third the risk of diabetes of those uh, and those with uh, 50 grams, 50 nanograms per milliliter or above had one-fifth of the risk that's actually called a dose response curve where you see a continued uh, improvement with uh, the increased level. If that's true, that is a fairly powerful uh, indicator. Again, I mentioned the study co-author Garland Cedric. Um, he's in the, the uh, 
School of Public Health, and uh, he was involved with this as well. <clears throat> His quote was, if uh, the levels were over 50, um, the, if the levels were under 30, they were over five times as high as the folks with the levels over 50. In other words, he's saying the same thing that they'd already quoted. Um, they just should have cleaned up their press release a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> further research is needed, and uh, he makes the point that this paper's uh, and past papers, or he thinks, create a strong association. Uh, his brother, Frank, is the uh, fellow I was trying to remember, uh, also an epidemiologist. He and Frank in 1980 um, pushed the story of uh, vitamin D and colon cancer risk. The Garlands and other and colleagues have recently found associations with uh, breast, lung, and uh, bladder cancers, or more recently. Um, <clears throat> Now, in order to reach the levels above 30, his estimate is that you do need to take um, supplements. He would say three to 5,000 units. I, I, we will typically have patients on about 5,000 units per day and watch their levels. Um, <clears throat> that's changed, though, with a significant association with sun exposure. It doesn't have to be a lot. Even just a brief 10 to 15-minute walk uh, at noon in most parts of the country, can greatly improve your uh, vitamin D level. The current uh, average daily amount recommendation is 400 international units. So again, for children, up to 600 international units for uh, ages 1 to 70. So you see significant differences in terms of recommendations. Uh, let's go to the journal article itself. Um, plus one. First of all, is that a good journal? Well, <clears throat> it's not the greatest. It's not New England Journal. It's not science. It's not nature. Um, PLOS is the, I think, Public Library of Science. It was founded by a, uh, I can't remember the name of the fellow. He was uh, head of NIH at one point. Uh, won some um, significant prizes in science uh, and unquestionably a great science. But here's why PLOS One gets some, uh, some thump, um, some criticism from a lot of people. It ushered in a new way of publishing information. It charged the author instead of charging for access for readers. So therefore, there's the uh, <clears throat> problem with... Um, potential conflict for authors. I, I pay them 1500 bucks. They publish my, my article and I can say that I'm published. Now, uh, it has, for the most part, avoided that uh, taint that you might uh, see associated with that. It's actually a fairly influential journal. Here's the, uh, the uh, article title, Plasma 25-hydroxy vitamin D, concentration and risk of type 2 diabetes and prediabetes, 12-year cohort study. So again, this is a cohort study. It's not following um, people from the beginning. It's taking a large population, looking at uh, levels and going backwards to follow them forward in time. Now, <clears throat> what they did see, um, as they said, they saw a fairly good dose response curve, especially with uh, di full-blown diabetes itself. Uh, if you uh, peg the risk at for those below 30 as 1, then the increase did go uh, 0 0.31, 0 0.29, 0.19 as you increased the serum level of vitamin D. How about over in the pre-diabetes uh, group? A similar thing, a little bit, a little bit fuzzier around uh, uh, the point uh, f the 40 to 49 level it was actually a little bit higher than the uh, 50 to s the above 50 level but again a fairly good dose response curve so again uh, <clears throat> some moderate in uh, interest I, I think you could at least call it another brick in the wall for an association between increased risk uh, for diabetes type 2 diabetes and um, 
and uh, what we used to consider appropriate vitamin D levels, but are beginning to find that maybe not. Now, here's an interesting point. When you go deeper into the tables, we saw significant p-value associated with a couple of things. One was being male. So is there some male interaction here? Uh, the other was actually taking calcium supplementation. Again, a couple of interesting points. They really didn't mention it uh, that much in their press releases. Is it conclusive? Nowhere near. Is it another brick in the wall? Very well, maybe. Thank you for your interest.